mes amis. My name is Andre. I'm a fur trader up in the wild north woods of Canada. I'd like to tell you a story about my dog, Nicky, the best husky ever born. It's a strange tale of how two natural enemies, a dog and a bear, became fast friends, and of how the dog, Nicky, saved my life. <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of my story. Now, when I first set eyes on Nicky, he was just a little ball of fur, a Malamute, one-eighth wolf and the rest Mackenzie Husky. He was only three months old, but I knew I had to have him as a companion on my long canoe trips. So I bought him, and we set off, Nicky setting up in the bow of the canoe as lookout and me paddling. Nicky was curious about everything. Why, one time we saw a mother duck give her ducklings their first lesson in swimming. At every stopping place, Nicky found some new adventure. One of my regular camping spots was called Little Thunder. As usual, just as soon as we set foot on shore, Nicky went off exploring. Not far downstream was the hibernating den of an old she-bear, Nuzak. Now, her cub, Niwa, born in hibernation, was exploring the world outside for the first time, and he was just as curious as Nicky. Somehow, in the big out-of-doors, Niwa managed to get lost. Now, whenever a bear cub gets in trouble, it's a standard rule to climb a tree, and that's just what Niwa did. Suddenly, the cub thought he had seen his mother, but instead it was Makus, old, mean, and mad with the instinct of the adult male bear to kill all cubs. The old she-bear, Nuzak, came roaring from her den, bound to protect her cub. The battle was fierce and quick. Nuzak gave her life to save her cub. Nicky had heard the commotion in the forest and had come excitedly barking to me. I followed him and soon found the ugly situation. We drove off old Makus from the base of the tree and after some trouble, I rescued Niwa from his treetop perch. He wasn't too anxious to be rescued. But with his mother dead and old Makus on the prowl, we were doing him a big favor. At first, Nicky didn't take too well to Niwa, and the bear cub didn't go for Nicky at all. For safekeeping and the protection of both of them, I leashed them together and the three of us set off in my canoe. It wasn't very long until we hit a stretch of rapids, real whitewater. And Nicky and Niwa picked this bad time to have a battle royal in the canoe. I frantically tried to avoid the jagged rocks and keep the canoe upright in the swirling water and at the same time separate my two brawling companions. But suddenly we capsized and were all three dumped into the roaring river. I grabbed the overturned canoe and pushed for shore. But as I did so, I could see two furry heads being swept downstream, now bobbing into view, now disappearing beneath the rough water. As soon as I could shove the canoe onto the bank, I raced downstream by foot, calling, Nicky! Nicky! But though I went a long way, calling and calling, I heard no answering bark, nor saw a sign of either of my two companions. Sadly, I gave them up for drowned in the swift rapids and returned to where I had beached my canoe. I had underestimated the stubborn will to live and the strength of these two young animals. They battled and swam and sank and rose again to the surface, gulping air, then floated exhausted, then battled to swim all over again until in slack water a mile or so downstream, they made it to the bank and lay panting and exhausted, but still very much alive. But their troubles were only beginning. Though young, they were natural enemies with very different ways of life. And they were still leashed together. Niwa's first thought upon catching his breath was to go looking for his mother, whom he still could not believe was dead. Nicky, on the other hand, wanted to find me. They were sure that these two goals were in opposite directions and so set off, only to find themselves engaged in a tug of war because of their leash. They tugged and they fought and they ran this way and that, first one dragging the other, and then the other way around. 
When they were brought face to face by the leash tangling around a tree, they engaged in a real fight, which continued until they both lay exhausted. They had nothing in common. When Niwa wanted to sleep, Nicky wanted to run and chase rabbits. When Niwa wanted to eat berries and grubs, Nicky wanted to sleep. Now, since it was impossible for Nicky to catch rabbits while towing a young bear, he finally realized that if he were to eat at all, he'd have to learn to eat like a bear. And so he did for a time. But when Niwa found a bee tree and began eating his fill of honey while all Nicky got was bee stings, it was too much. He fought and yanked and stretched and pulled and suddenly was free of the leash. Nicky hightailed it away from the bees and from Niwa too, forever he hoped. He ran and he ran and suddenly he caught the man scent. Barking joyously, he followed his nose and soon after dark he came to a campsite. He could see that it was not me, but his experience had only been with kindly people, and so he approached the camp. But this man cursed him with a harsh voice, and picking up a rifle, sent a bullet winging toward the dog. <coughs> Nicky turned and ran back into the wilderness. He was dejected and lonesome. Rejected by man, he belonged to the wilderness now. But it was lonely and dark, and Nicky was miserable very much in need of a friend. He wandered all night, hungry and forlorn, and when, just after daybreak, he saw a black bear cub coming toward him, he rushed up to Niwa and greeted him as a friend. Niwa was glad to see Nicky, too, for he'd been just as lonesome as the dog. So the strange friendship was formed that lasted many a moon. Nicky had to learn to be a dog again. A diet of roots and grubs was fine for Niwa, but nature had decreed that a growing dog must have meat, and for this she had given him the hunting instinct. Nicky became a good hunter, but one time he took on a wolverine, one of the forest's fiercest fighters, and suffered a bad nip on the foreleg. Nicky was laid up for a day or two, and Niwa claimed the leftovers from a lynx's kill and brought them to Nicky. With the coming of late summer, Nicky reached the fullness of his strength. A Malamute is the king of dogs, but the wilderness life had shaped Nicky into a dog such as the North had never seen before. He weighed 125 pounds, a giant of his breed. Niwa was less than half grown, but already brute strong. And yet these two born enemies, even in the roughest play, would never hurt each other. One day, as the two were roughhousing together, tumbling and rolling, they bumped right into old Makus, and time had not improved his temper. He rushed at Niwa, growling fiercely, and the cub raced for a tree and clambered up into the higher branches. Luckily, Makus wasn't much of a tree climber, but it looked to Nicky as if he were going to stand guard at the base of the tree all day, and maybe all night, too. He had to lure Makus away somehow. Finally, he had an idea. He knew he could outrun the old bear, so he rushed at Makus, barking furiously and nipping at him. It worked. Makus lumbered after him, and Nicky soon lost the old bear, while Niwa was given a chance to get down and away to safety. So, turn about. The two wilderness friends helped each other. Now, until now, Nicky and Niwa had hardly noticed the change of seasons. But winter came as a wonderful surprise. The sharp bite in the air, the crisp, cold snow quickened their blood and put a new zest in their rough-and-tumble games. But as the days grew shorter and colder, Niwa began to feel a deep inner need common to all bears. It was time to hibernate. And so it was not by accident that one day the dog and the cub found their way back to a familiar place, the hibernating den where Niwa had been born. Niwa's instinct told him just what he must do. He must go in and settle down to a long winter slumber. 
Nicky couldn't understand this at all. Why, they should be out hunting. This was no time to sleep. He tried to rouse Niwa, nipping at him and barking. But Niwa just yawned and made it plain he didn't want to play. In a moment, he was fast asleep. Nicky was unhappy and lonesome again. But he was also hungry, and so decided that if Niwa wouldn't hunt with him, he'd have to hunt alone. So reluctantly, he left the sleeping Niwa in the den and set out. Now, although nature had released the bear from all the problems of survival, for the dog, she decreed a time of hunger and hardship. For weeks, she had been blotting out every scent and sign of game with biting cold and heavy snow. Nicky finally found a little muskrat. <laughs> but all he got for his trouble was a nip on the nose and a new respect for muskrats. Soon he had wandered far from the den and deep into strange territory. A strong scent now led him to a herd of elk. He was so hungry now he would try anything. So he cut one out of the herd and began running it down. The elk was tiring. Nicky sensed it. He was confident. But then the elk turned at bay. And now that Nicky had him, he didn't know what to do with him. When the huge animal charged, Nicky retreated and decided to try a smaller game. But his luck was poor, and day after day his hunger grew. Then one night he caught a distant sound, the howling of wolves. It stirred Nicky and awakened a deep and dormant instinct. The wolves had been on the trail of a winter-starved deer, and now they had found the half-frozen carcass. It was natural for the wolf in Nicky to answer to the call of the pack. Beyond his need for food, he had a deeper need for companionship and he was sure he would find it with the wolf brothers of his blood. He eagerly approached the carcass, but the wolves snarling turned on him, slashing and biting, and he was only able to escape when the wolves began fighting among themselves. So Nicky went without food for another night. The next morning, however, lonelier than ever and aching with hunger, he came quite suddenly on the man scent again, and mixed with it another exciting scent, fresh meat. Nicky didn't know it, but he'd stumbled on a trap line, all baited with fresh meat. The dog knew that there was something guarding the meat, and he learned to cover it up and then wait for the snap of steel before taking the meat. He robbed half a dozen traps before he was full. Now, the trap line belonged to an evil bully of a man named Lobo, and when he discovered that his traps were being robbed, he was furious. So he baited the traps again, this time with poisoned food. That night, when Nicky made his rounds, he sniffed curiously at the poisoned meat. It didn't smell right, so he only ate a little bit of it. It was enough to paralyze him slightly, though, and he just made it back to his hideout in a windfall. Lebeau and his Indian helper were able to follow Nicky's tracks and locate his windfall. While Nicky slept off the effects of the poison, they caught a rabbit and tied it to a tree, and then spread their big traps all around and covered them with snow. The two men then set fire to Nicky's windfall and hid from his sight. The crackling flames woke Nicky and he ran from his hideout. As he did, he caught sight of the rabbit. He thought it strange that the little animal didn't move, and he approached it cautiously when, snap, one of the big traps caught his paw. Now a huge wolf came slinking through the woods, and seeing Nicky's plight, headed toward him to kill the dog. Lebeau's Indian helper didn't want the dog to die in such a horrible fashion, and begged Lebeau to shoot the wolf. But the cruel Lebeau enjoyed fights and bloodshed and sat down to watch the slaughter. He didn't reckon on Nicky's strength. Trapped as he was, he still fought the wolf furiously and finally killed him. Did you see that, Laveau said, hardly believing his eyes. Oh, what I could do with a dog of such strength. Makoki, the Indian, said, make good sled dog, put in harness. No harness, said Laveau, that dog belongs in a fighting pit. 
Why, at the trading post, he'll win more furs for me than a man could ever trap. Nicky was happy to be with men again and wagged his tail. But when Lebeau saw this, he scowled. Dog has weakness. He's friendly. Fighting dog must hate. Give me the club, Makoki. I'll beat him, and when I get through with this dog, he'll hate even his own shadow. And so the club fell on Nicky day after day, night after night, until the crescent moon grew into a full moon of Uski Pipun, the eve of the new year. At every trading post in the Northland, this was the time for celebration, feasting, and dog fighting. It was to one of these posts that LeBeau brought Nicky. Not the trusting Nicky of old, but a snarling, savage beast. Much had happened to me since I had lost Nicky the previous winter. I had become factor, which means boss, of the very trading post to which LeBeau now brought Nicky. I had always believed that dogfighting was cruel and savage and inhuman. So when I became factor, I made a rule that there would be no dogfighting at my trading post. But LeBeau wasn't a believer in rules. When he saw the sign prohibiting fighting I had posted at the dogfighting pit, he kicked it aside and quickly matched Nicky with Tao, who was the champion fighter of the post. The betting was all done in furs, and it was heavy, most favoring Tao. When all the bets were down, Tao and Nicky were put into the pit. Nicky at first didn't pay too much attention to Tao. It wasn't dogs he hated, it was men. But Tao, a trained fighter, got behind him and suddenly attacked. It was a fierce and bloody struggle, but Nicky's wilderness training was too much for Tao, and he was rescued from the pit just in time, or Nicky would have killed him. Now LeBeau wanted to bet that Nicky could fight two dogs at once and was trying to make another match when I heard the commotion and went over to the dog pits. I told you no dog fighting when I'm factor and I meant what I said. Now you men, all of you and your dogs, I want you out of here by daybreak. Then I noticed that there was a dog still in the pit and that he was hurt. I asked who owned him and LeBeau answered that he did. I told LeBeau to take care of him, that he was hurt. LeBeau said he had a better idea. He'd let the dog take care of me, and without warning, he shoved me into the pit with a snarling dog. The fierce dog lunged toward me. Steady, 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 boy. Easy. The dog stopped and looked at me with bloodshot eyes. Easy now. Do small. There, boy. That's better now. The dog moved slowly over toward me and rubbed his head on my legs. Well, for a minute I thought you were going to bite my leg off. What made you change your mind? You thought you knew me, huh? <coughs> I don't know you. You, you could not be... Nicky? Nicky! Ha, 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 ha! All right, all right, I believe you. No wonder I did not recognize you. Why, when I lost you, you were a little pup. I was so happy at finding Nicky again that I forgot all about LeBeau. But he had not forgotten me. He and Makoki jumped into the pit, and LeBeau snapped the leash on Nicky and gave the dog to Makoki. Then he suddenly kicked me on the chin and nearly knocked me out. This fighting with the feet is called La Savate, and LeBeau, huge and heavy, was a master at it. I fought as furiously as I could, but his weight was too much, and he finally got me down, and pulling his knife was about to finish me off. Just then, Makoki cut Nicky's leash, and with a surge, the dog hit LeBeau and knocked him off my back. The bully rolled over and lay still. LeBeau had fallen on his own knife. Another spring and another trip downriver for supplies. Nicky and I together again. Makoki too, for the Indian had helped Nicky save my life. Naturally, we stopped at Little Thunder, and Nicky immediately went running off into the woods. 
I followed him. Nicky! Nicky! I don't want to lose you again! Nicky ran right up to a den, barking happily, and suddenly a big brown bear came lumbering out. The two animals greeted each other like long-lost friends. I could hardly believe my eyes, but it was true. It was the bear cub, Niwa, now full-grown. When Niwa saw me, however, he turned and lumbered away. Nicky couldn't understand it. He barked and barked at Niwa and tried to turn him around, but the bear continued on into the forest. Nicky got a very strange look on his face. He started after Niwa again, then stopped, looked back at me, and finally trotted back to my side. For Nicky, the call of the wilderness was fainter now. The call of man was loud and clear. But I know he'll never forget Niwa. And perhaps even the wild heart of Niwa will remember, too, a wilderness adventure and a strange brotherhood that was never meant to be.